Thank you for watching this presentation. This PowerPoint presentation had previously been given in December 2018 as part of the Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History Lecture Series. I recently received a request from the Park City Museum to place the talk on YouTube so that it would be available to a wider audience, particularly during this COVID-19 pandemic when many of us are housebound. And it's also to keep a record of the presentation for future educational purposes. Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History is an arm of the Park City Museum and is our aim to raise funds to stabilise Park City's historic mining structures. We've been doing this for over five years and have managed to raise over $400,000 and stabilise about six structures that would otherwise have been lost. All of us are volunteers and 100% of the money raised goes to stabilise these structures. Further information on our organisation is provided at the end of this talk. As you are listening to this, you may wonder where my accent is from. Well, I grew up in Northern England. My name is Donovan Simmons. I'm a Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History Committee member and a, and a Park City Museum docent. I grew up in Northern England and studied mining engineering at college. I initially emigrated to Western Canada in 1971 and worked in the mining industry there. I was transferred to Utah in 1976 and moved to Park City a year later. I helped start a mining consulting company in 1980 and recently retired from consulting after 30 years. Anyway, enough about me. Now let's talk about the old park, how the old Park City miners turned shiny rocks into silver bars. The talk is about the processes involved in upgrading the ores that came out of the Park City mines between the period of 1871 when mining first started in the park through about 1920. After this later date the processes changed. But I want to talk about how the early miners upgraded and concentrated the ores, sometimes called milling the ores, shipped the concentrates to the smelters in the Salt Lake Valley, where they produced bars of silver, lead and gold and other metals in big furnaces. You will see when you look at this slide, the ore has shiny darker parts interspaced with white crystals. The dark shiny parts are called galena, which is a lead sulfide ore. But in Park City, the galena contained relatively high proportions of silver. In which case, the ore is referred to as argentiferous galena, from the Latin argentum, the word for silver, which is the symbol AG. The first process is to separate the shiny black parts, which is the valuable ore we want, from the white quartz crystals which have no commercial value. The earliest method of concentrating the mine production was to manually pick the good looking ores, in this case the dark shiny lumps, from the waste rock. In most cases the pickers, or in this slide the ball maidens, broke the larger lumps with hammers to liberate any co-mingled rocks. This slide shows ball maidens. Ball is an old Cornish word for mine. In Cornwall, probably in the early 19th century, generally younger and healthier women worked on the surface to sort the mine production. Their large headgear was an early form of safety glasses. The drapes around the hats protected their eyes and face from the flying rock fragments produced from the hammering. Here we can see the total metal production from Park City from 1875 to 1967. This data was developed by Keith Drusty, a former superintendent at the Mayflower Mine, to show that silver was not the only metal produced in Park City. In fact, it represented about 40% in terms of total value. Lead was next followed by gold, zinc and copper. 
The ores in the local mines were quite complex. Silver, lead and zinc often occur together, but the slide shows that gold was important. This mainly came from the Mayflower mine, which is, a, is west of the current Jordanelle Reservoir. These are the main producing mines in the district. There were many mines operating over the years. In Park City's glory days of the 1890s, there were over 30 mines operating. But over the years, the mines consolidated. And this shows a summary of the main producers, showing their relative importance in terms of percentage of total metal production value. The Silver King was the richest mine in the district, followed by the Daily West Judge, the Ontario and the Mayflower. The Ontario was the first major mine to open in the 1870s and the last mine to close in the district in 1982. Sometimes there is confusion over milling versus smelting. The photo on the left shows the Silver King mill, probably about 1910. The mill, sometimes called the concentrator or ore processing plant, sorts the waste rock from the valuable ore and is typically located close to the mine shaft or the portal. The purpose of the mill is to concentrate the metal content of the product shipped to the smelter. The coarse rejects from the mill are referred to as waste rock and the fine rejects about the size of sugar or below are called tailings. The smelters were located some distance away from the mines. In, in the case of Park City, they were typically in the Salt Lake Valley or out by Tuella in the West Valley. It is expensive to ship ores to the smelters and to process these ores, hence the need to concentrate the ore. The smelting process, on the other hand, involves melting the ore in high temperature furnaces by adding coke and various fluxes such as limestone, silica and zinc. The initial oxidizing process, called sintering, produces sulfur dioxide. Remember these were sulfide ores and also produced lead oxide. This was then reduced in a blast furnace to produce molten metals which are further separated into lead and silver bars. The quality of the ore was such that it could be shipped directly to the smelter and avoid the mill. This would save expensive processing costs and avoid inevitable losses of saleable ore during the processing. So how did the old miners decide if the ore could be direct shipped or needed to pass through the mill? The obvious first way is a visual ex examination of the ore. Lots of shiny heavy rocks were a good indication of ore grade. Another is the weight of the car. Silver ore is about three times heavier a similar volume of quartz. The miners also knew which sections of the mine likely produced the highest grade ore. They could divert ore from the rich zone around the mill. The last and most precise method was to sample each ore car, store the cars on the surface and then, possibly the next day, decide to process the ore or ship it directly to the smelter. The larger mines incorporated automatic sampling systems. If the quality of the ore was such that it could be shipped directly to the smelter and avoid the mill. This table indicates why the Silver King mine was the most profitable, followed by the Daily West and the Ontario. It is a snapshot from 1904 and shows that 54% of production from the Silver King mine was sufficiently high grade that it could be shipped directly to the smelter without being upgraded in the mill. The Daily West had 20% direct ship ore and none of the Ontario production could be direct shipped. It all had to be processed through the mill. This is a large effect on the profitability of the overall mining operations. There were two basic types of processes 
used in the early days of Park City Mining. Chemical processes and physical processes. The chemical process involving mercury was developed in the 16th century in Mexico and involved crushing the ore to a fine sugar-like powder and combining it with mercury. This process was refined in the Comstock region of Nevada in the 1860s where the crushed ore was mixed in heated tanks with salt, mercury and copper sulphate. The mercury attracted the silver to form an amalgam which was heated, the mercury was boiled off and the silver formed a sponge which could then be melted into silver bars. Tobacco juice and sagebrush were sometimes added to this brew to allegedly improve performance. This was one of the earliest processes used at the Marsac and McHenry mills. It was an expensive process, particularly in terms of heat required and mercury consumption. The adverse health and environmental aspects of mercury were just starting to be discovered. E. H. Russell developed a new chemical process that added salt and copper sulphate to a tank containing hot water and crushed ore. The ensuing chemical leached or exhibited the silver from the ore. This was then roasted to form silver bars. Much of the research on the process was carried out in Park City around 1888. The Russell process proved to be more cost effective and the mercury amalgamation mills were phased out. These hot chemical processes consumed lots of coal from Colville and the close by mines in Wyoming. The air and water emissions from these plants combined with the noise of the stamp mill crushers, must have created a harsh environment in downtown Park City in the late 1880s. No wonder the stream through town was renamed Poison Creek. Another chemical or surface chemical process in extensive use today is froth flotation. It was introduced in the 1920s and involves crushing the ore to a much finer size Think of face powder. The crushed ore is combined with water and surfactant chemicals in a large tank and air bubbles are passed through the slurry. Additional chemicals are added to selectively collect the metal ores. These were filtered and the filter cake is shipped to the smelters. Froth flotation processes are still extensively used today in all sorts of ore processing plants. Physical processes involve separating the ore from waste rock based on factors such as visual appearance, weight or specific gravity differences, and size differences. The physical processes dominated the industry from about 1890 onwards. And they are shown in the next slide and will be described in more detail later. Here we can see a summary of the timeline of the processes used in the mills in Park City. The initial high-grade production in the 1870s was shipped to smelters in Omaha, Nebraska, following a 24-mile haul overland to a railhead in Salt Lake. The first mills to be built here were chemical plants from the mid-1870s to the mid-1880s. A much more efficient and less costly and lower polluting physical plants dominated all processing in Park City from about 1890 onwards. The upper photo was taken about 1880 is of one of Park City's first large mills, the Marsac. It was built around 1874 directly east of the museum, approximately where the current transit center is located. Note the large number of chimney stacks, which reflect not only the existence of steam engines, but also to exhaust the process and combustion gases from the roasters. The size of a mill was designated by its crushing capacity in terms of stamp mills. In 1874, the Marsac 
had 20 stamps and 40 were added the following year. A stamp mill is shown in the lower photo. The one shown was powered by a water wheel, but the stamps in the Marsac mill would have been powered by steam engines. There is a central rotating shaft with lifters, which raises the vertical hammers and then allows them to drop onto the rocks below. In 1877, the Ontario mill had 40 850 pound stamps with an 8 inch drop and 94 drops a minute. That'll be quite a noise. The literally deafening sound of the operating stamp mills could be heard throughout the town. It was music to the ears of many residents whose livelihood was dependent upon the mills operating. Unfortunately, it probably caused some serious hearing problems for the operators at the mill. I would like to introduce you now to the concept of gravity separation, which is the central concept in the physical separation of minerals and was extensively used in Park City from 1890 and for the next 50 years. In fact, many of the smaller mills throughout the world today still use these gravity dependent processes. They take advantage of the specific gravity difference between the host rock and metallic minerals. The specific gravity of water is one. A bucket full of limestone would be 2.3 times as heavy as a similar bucket full of water. At the other extreme, the same bucket filled with gold would weigh 16 times as much. Galena, the main park city ore, has a specific gravity of about 7.5. This is about three times that of limestone. So how do we use these physical differences to separate galena from limestone or quartz? I am go to, going to try to demonstrate how we utilize these specific gravity differences to separate particles in a column of water. The falling velocity of equal sized particles in water will increase as the specific gravity increases. In other words, the heavier, the more dense, higher specific gravity particles will fall faster and the lower specific gravity particles will fall slower. If the specific gravity is less than one, it will float, as in this piece of wood we have here. I've also got a piece of amber, which has a specific gravity of about 1.2. Um, a plastic bead here, which has a specific gravity of about 1.5, a sandstone particle, 2.2, and some lead shot, which is about 11. You'll see when I drop, invert these, that the particles fall at different speeds. I just want to show you this in slow motion. Initially, the wood particle rises. You will see the lead particle fall first, followed by the sandstone, then the plastic bead, and then quite a ways after, the amber particle comes drifting down. Imagine now if we introduce a vertical stream of water from bottom to top, such that the, the light particles move up and the heavy particles move down. In this way, we've got a two product separation. Light particles go up, heavy particles go down. That's the fundamental principle of many of these early water dependent processes, such as tables and jigs. This principle was also used by the early prospectors. The top photo shows prospectors working on a sluice box. Here, crushed ore was fed at the top of the sluice with flowing water. Across the box at intervals they constructed barriers which collected the heavy materials. The lighter particles flowed over the barriers to the next one located downstream. The prospector using a pan in the lower photo swirled his collection of smaller rocks in the pan in water. 
the lighter particles moved to the outside and the heavier ones, hopefully gold, remained in the center. Another aspect of these water-only processes is that they require a sized feed in order to be efficient, roughly in the ratio of 4 to 1 for galena and silica. For example, it would feed 2 by a half, half by an eighth, etc. This is why there were so many screens in the mills. This shows a bank of concentrating tables in the Silver King mill. An interesting thing to note is how the electric lights are hung close to the tables so that the operator could visually inspect the separation. A closer look will see the band of light and dark material on the table. The light bands represent the lower specific gravity rocks and the dark bands are the heavy galena ore. This shows the operation of a modern table. Note it's about 16 feet long and about 6 feet wide. Crushed ore in the form of a pulp is fed from the top and processed water is also spread along the top of the table. The light particles are carried over the front lip by the process water. The heavy particles, in this case the galena, travel along the raised riffles and then exit to the left hand side of the table. This is what is left of a concentrating table at the California Comstock Mill. It is located on Park City Mountain where the Keystone Run meets Jupiter Access on Skier's left. Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History has been stabilizing this mill amongst others it was built around 1900, and I'll talk more about this project later. The two main physical separating techniques used in Park City Mills from the 1890s through the 1950 were tables and jigs. The jig uses pulsating water to separate the light particles from the heavy ones. They were generally fed with the crushed, coarser material typically 1 inch by 10 mesh or roughly 25 by 2 millimeters. This graphical presentation by All Mineral Jigs, a large mineral processing company out of Germany, shows a cross section through a jig. It is essentially a U-tube shaped vessel filled with water. Downward pressure on the water on the left side causes the water on the right to rise and the mineral bed on the right expands. When the pressure is released, the water in the bed moves down and the bed contracts. The different specific gravities of the particles cause them to accelerate and settle at different rates. The result is a stratification of the bed with the heavy particles on the bottom and the light particles above. The bed pulsates frequently to achieve this stratification at a rate of about one pulse every two seconds. The lighter particles flow over the weir at the outlet of the jig and the heavies pass through the jig screen and exit out of a compartment below the screen bed. I would like to introduce you to a couple of Park City mills. The first and probably the most prestigious mill in Park City if not in the western US, was the Silver King. It was essentially a wooden structure, and when it was built in 1899, it was considered a state-of-the-art mill throughout the country. There were two streams, each processing 150 tons a day. It was located at the same location as the remains of the current mill at the base of the Bonanza express lift on Park City Mountain. It consisted of crushers, screens, jigs, Wolfley tables and filter presses to dewater the fines. An automatic sampling system was added in 1901 and froth flotation followed in 1915. Mills around this time were often built on hillsides the mine door is fed at the uppermost point and each consecutive process would be carried out on the floor below. 
This avoided expensive pumping since the ore would flow by gravity to the next process. The mill was destroyed by fire on January the 27th, 1921, and a new mill was built, essentially with a steel and concrete structure, within a year. Quite an accomplishment. It would probably take twice as long to build it today. The throughput capacity of the new mill was 300 tonnes a day. All of the mine ore was crushed to pass one and a half inches in a new gyratory crusher. It was split and was screened on four new vibrating screens. The oversize was crushed to minus half inch and this was fed to 12 Hartz jigs. The minus 10 mesh material was processed on 19 Wolfley tables. The fines were further crushed in a ball mill to minus 60 mesh and this material was fed to two banks of callow flotation cells. Filters and thickeners were utilised to dewater the concentrates and tailings. And a new automatic sampling system was built to verify production grade. In its day, this mill was truly state of the art and a world leader in mineral processing. If you look at the skyline in the top right hand corner of the photo, you can see the aerial tramway. It was built in 1901 and it took the concentrates from the mill to the rail loadout facility in town. The iconic Silver King Coalition building is shown in the lower right corner. Rail wagons were loaded here and they transported the concentrates to the smelters in the Salt Lake Valley. Sadly, this building was lost to a fire in July 1981. This is a recent photograph of the Silver King Mill, showing the exterior and interior images. The good news is that it is still around. The bad news is that it is slowly falling apart. Another reason to protect our mining heritage sooner rather than later. These are the wooden Silver King water storage tanks which are located on the hillside directly south of the mill and supplied processed water to the mill. Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History has been stabilising the tanks, just in time I might add. Without this work they would have fallen apart and been lost forever. The next mill is the California Consta, which I mentioned earlier is located close to the Keystone Run on Park City Mountain. These photographs were taken around 1910. The remains of the mill we see today are a small part of the original structures. There were two underground mines located in an area close to the head of Thames Canyon. The Comstock Mine, incorporated in London in 1882, and the California Mine one year earlier. According to Boutwell, the plant comprises a modern mill, hoisting equipment, an office, and a bunk and boarding house. The 120 ton per day mill comprised a wet crusher, three cylindrical or trommel screens, an elevator, three jigs, one Huntingdon and six Wilfley tables, an arrangement for receiving steam and water from the shaft plant. The California and Comstock companies were amalgamated in 1917 following mineral claims disputes. Both mines contained high proportions of sphalerite or zinc ore. In 1918, the properties and mill were taken over by Silver King Consolidated, Sol and Spiros Company, and the mill was upgraded to 150 tonnes per day. In 1924, the operation was sold to Silver King Coalition, and the mill was closed. This shows some recent photographs taken during the stabilisation work performed by Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History. 
The upper photograph shows a Wilfley table. The lower left is a rotating or trommel screen and the lower right is a roll crusher. You can see the perilous state of the plant prior to stabilization. Nearby Jupiter Bowl has an average snowfall of over 300 inches per year and this amount of snow over a hundred years has taken its toll on this old wooden structure. Thanks to all of you who donated to the cause of saving these historic mining structures in Park City. The California Comstock Mill can be seen and appreciated for years to come. Now let's take a brief look at the smelting process to convert the mill concentrates into silver and lead bars. You'll recall the concentrates were shipped from the mills by train to the to smelters in the Salt Lake Valley. Remember that the Park City ores were complex sulfide ores. Galena is lead sulfide and sphalerite is zinc sulfide. The concentrates were initially introduced into a roaster which had excess air or oxygen plus sand, limestone and coke to reduce the sulphur content. This produced a sintered ore for smelting. One of the byproducts of the process was sulphur dioxide. This had an adverse effect on air quality in the South Salt Lake Valley. A review of historical literature reveals a number of complaints about the adverse health effects of these emissions, but they were largely overlooked in favour of increased industrialization. The sintered ore was transferred to high temperature blast furnaces, to which was added coke, iron and other fluxes. The carbon monoxide produced from coke combustion reduced the metal oxides and produced a molten lead silver mixture. Zinc was then added to the liquid lead. The silver migrated to the zinc and the mixture is volatilized to remove the zinc and leave silver. This is called the Parks process, named after Alexander Parks who patented the process in 1850. Park City did have some early smelters as these photographs show. They started around 1880, but had limited success due to a poor understanding of the technology for Park City ores. It was also the wrong location, since the smelters consumed large amounts of coke, limestone and silica, which were available at much lesser cost in the Salt Lake Valley. Initially, over 34 smelters sprang up in the Salt Lake Valley, and also around Tuella, west of Salt Lake. This diagram summarizes the early Park City smelters and refineries. The first Marsac, McHenry and Ontario mills in the mid-1870s utilized the chemical processes described earlier, but they were unable to produce silver bars above about 70% silver content. A map of 1882 shows the first true Park City smelter. For a time there was a chloridizing and leaching plant introduced into the old Ontario mill in 1914. And there were two zinc refineries, the Griselli Zinc Refinery, which lasted only from 1915 to 1916, and the Judge Manufacturing and Smelting Company built a zinc refinery using a new electrolytic process in Deer Valley. This lasted from 1917 to 1929. Prior to about 1908, zinc production from the Park City mines had been minimal. Svalerite or zinc blend has a specific gravity similar to pyrite, which was usually rejected during the physical concentration processes. It was referred to as a middling product since it has a specific gravity midway between galena and quartz. The markets for zinc did not justify the expensive milling and refining costs. As a result, in the early years of mining in Park City, zinc was usually sent 
to tailings. However, the introduction of new electrolytic refining processes changed the market structure. One of the first electrolytic plants in the US was built in Deer Valley in 1917. The Daily Judge and Daily West mines contained high proportions of zinc, as did the California Comstock mine. The Judge mining and smelting plant processed middlings as well as recycled tailings. The plant was also fed with coal from Colville and sulfuric acid from Utah Copper, now Rio Tinto. The electrolytic process was a large consumer of electrical power from the hydro plant in Snake Creek Tunnel. This plant was acquired by Daly in 1917. Around the turn of the last century, the Salt Lake Valley was one of the largest smelting hubs in the country. Lead and silver smelting had been a hit and miss industry in Utah prior to Gustav Billing and Anton Eilers who bought German technology via Leadville to Utah in 1876. They were part owners of the Germania Smelting and Refining Company, the leader in smelting in the West. The American Smelting and Refining Company, ASARCO, bought Germania in 1898 and built a new plant in Murray in 1902. At one time there were over 10,000 workers in Utah's smelting industry, centered in the southern part of the Salt Lake Valley. The top photo shows the Murray smelter in about 1910. All Park City ores were smelted here. At its peak it had a capacity of 2,200 tons a day of ore. It had six roasters and eight blast furnaces. It closed down in 1949 and was declared a Superfund site in 1994. The site was successfully remediated and the large Intermountain Medical Center was built there in 2007. These are the remnants of the Midvale Smelter Slag. It's a black shiny material which was produced in the furnaces and can be seen on the northern bank of I-215 prior to the I-215 I-15 interchange. So that concludes this Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History talk on shiny rocks to silver bars. For more information visit our website shown above or for questions on this presentation Go to dfsimmons7 at gmail.com and thank you for watching.